have um, conductivity in the 10 to minus eight up to minus six. Once you start to get into the minus four um, to zero Siemens per centimeters, you start to get into what we call semiconductors and anything above that, we're actually me uh, more metal-like. And so you can see some polymers like polyaniline and uh, polypyrrole and so forth are getting closer to the metal-like um, um, metal -like, um, conductivity and, um, and trans um, polyacetylene um, have actually have outdone uh, most of all the polymers. So what we're interested in is looking at polyaniline, which has have, um, reported conductivities that are close to metal-like and see if we can improve on the other properties while maintaining that conducting um, property. So like I was saying, conducting polymers are important because um, they do have optical, electrical, and some magnetic properties um, similar to metals and definitely in the semiconductor range. Um, you can get the mechanical and processing properties of these polymers um, that are more close to um, plastic. They can be thermally and chemically stable at room temperature. And one of the more Im important point is that you can tune these properties using synthetic processes. And so, um, sorry, I'm gonna close that. And so um, some of the applications include organic circuits, flexible display devices, um, solar cells, um, sensors, and, um, and now we've gotten into supercapacitors, batteries, and a lot more types of application, but these are just a few. When it comes to polyaniline, it's a very interesting polymer because it has three basic forms. So the fully oxidized form, the partially oxidized form, and the fully reduced form. But it was shown that only the partially oxidized form if you treat that with some acid, so upon protonation, it becomes a salt that is now conductive, but none of the other forms are conductive. Even if you fully oxidize this salt, it is no longer conductive. And so it's interesting because it was, um, I mean, a lot of research has, has gone on with polyaniline to demonstrate um, why so is conductive? Oh, sorry. Why is conductive um, upon the, the the dope or acidic state? Now, the con the the properties that are are made polyaniline so so such a nice polymer is that it does have high conductivity in the dope state. We're talking greater than hundred Siemens per centimeter. It is redox reversible, so you can have both the oxidized and reduced form. And it is, um, it is electrochromic, so the different oxidized forms have different colors, so you can identify them. Um, it's highly stable in the dope state in air, and that's really important because most um, conducting polymers are not stable in air when it's doped. And it has some electronic, optical, and magnetic properties and mechanical properties that are unique to po um, polymers that make it a nice material to work with. However, um, as well, polyaniline has been um, known to have applications mostly as um, anti-corrosive coatings and in the electromagnetic interference area. And also it's been used for um, um, printed circuit board um, finishing. However, it has a lot more potential for applications for all these that are in black. So whole inject layers, actuators, chemical and, and solution, vapor, um, chemical vapor and solution, sensors, um, the electrochromic properties of polyaniline make it attractive for use in um, windows and mirrors and so forth. And so it has not realized these, these applications. And I believe it's not realized this application for two main reasons. It is 
difficult to process, even though there have been some, um, some studies and some success over the years to help with the processability of polyaniline. But those have not been overwhelmingly successful to take it over the threshold to be used. And also, even though it's redox reversible, it's not redox stable. So after several cycles, it starts to decompose. And so these are the two main properties we'd like to address with polyaniline. And so we thought about maybe we could redesign polyaniline by taking dyes such as this, where it has a fused section. So with polyaniline, the backbone is phenyl, nitrogen, phenyl, nitrogen, so forth. So we maintain that same backbone, but we're fusing some of the units. So we're preventing a lot of this rotation um, along the, the backbone of the polymer. We're making it more rigid. And also we thought maybe we could um, explore the effect of these counter ions on the conductivity and or most importantly, the redox stability of this material because it is known that these heteroatoms can um, one, adjust the frontier orbitals of the, 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 the dye, or in this case would be the polymer, and it could potentially stabilize the radical species so that it is not um, highly reactive in the oxidized state, and so it's more stable, and you can go between the, the oxidized and, and, and reduced form. And so, and also we can use these alkyl groups to make it more processable. And so my our hypothesis is that this polymer will have similar behavior to polyaniline because we're maintaining the backbone of polyaniline, but much better electrochemical stability and processability. So when we started in this project, we didn't start exactly where we wanted to start. We started where it was easier to start. And so we've been able, we've been working with rhodamine dyes for a while. And so when the chemistry came about that we could make these polyrhodamine, we decided to start there because it was easier. And so if you look at the structure though, it's not quite the polyaniline backbone because now you have a nitrogen phenyl, but you have a carbon instead of another nitrogen. So the question is how does this carbon affect the, the properties, the conducting properties and all the other um, redox stability, our redox reversibility and so forth of the polymer. So I try to identify the changes. So we have, instead of a nitrogen here, we have a carbon, we maintain the oxygen and the R group in this case by nature of the fact that it's um, the xanthine based dyes, it has a benzoic acid there. So we decided to make that polymer it was easy to make. We could start from fluorescein. Fluorescein is cheap. We could triflate it, ditriflate it, and do a bouquois hartwig um, reaction to make the polymer. And so we can make this no problem. And so that's where we started. The, the proton NMR looks good. We can follow this. We make a small molecule first. So we can follow the, the peaks to see um, the shifting. So once the, the, the reaction, once the reaction has, um, we've made these bonds here, we can see, I don't have the small molecule here, the starting material, but you get a um, upfield shifting of these xanthine core um, proteins. And of course, if the, um, if when the, 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 the dye is open, is not in this pyrocyclic form, then this, um, protein next to the carboxylic next to the um, carboxylic acid will move more downfield. So we can actually this pro, this NMR I'm showing you is actually more of the closed form. Once it's open, this protein will move closer to about 8.3 to 8.5. But we can make this, and we understand the protein NMR now. Um, it took us some, a while to figure that figure things out there. Also, this is this this polymer is highly soluble in methanol and DMSO, and is partially soluble in water, so we can get some processability out of it. The FTIR spectra looks reasonable. Um, so, 
it depends on if we are in the acid or the base form. And um, the top form is the, is the base, the bottom form is the acid. So what we're we were looking for is, I'm sorry, I went too far. What we're looking for to see if in the, um, in the acidic form, if we're seeing the same um, imine formation of that paraphenylin uh, position like you would see in the polyaniline. And so we're looking at these, specifically at these two peaks in the FTIR that represents the quinone and the benzoid um, um, structure. Mm -hmm. And so we can see a little bit of the quinoid structure. We can see the benzoid structure as well. And um, when you acidify it, however, it seemed to kind of correlate and you don't see the, it's not as, as well defined as it was in the base form. So that was a little strange for us. Now the question is, does it behave though like polyaniline? And what we're looking for there is that if polyaniline in the um, base form, that's before you protonate it, it absorbs about 600 nanometers. But when you protonate it, you form these polaron species and now the absorption um, switch redshift to oh, about 850 nanometers. So the question is, if we protonate these polyrhodamines, would we get the same thing? The answer here is no, we do not get that. So it doesn't behave in this case in the UV um, spectra as polyaniline. So when you protonate it, that's the red peak, you get a slight blue shift, but you don't see the dramatic blue shift that you um, would expect to see if it were forming these polarons. We did do some zeta potential in solution looking at the overall um, charge of the, of the polymer at certain pH. So you can see that right around pH four to five, um, which is where you would expect the deprotonation of the, the um, benzoic acid portion it starts to occur around pH four to five, and then more and more of the dye gets um, deprotonated, you get the negative charge, and it, nothing seemed to change much after pH seven or eight. And so we know that if we wanna see the acidic regime, we need to be at least pH three to see that, which is what we were going after. Unfortunately, we were not able to get anything with the acidic form of this polymer. However, at about pH five, we were able to run EPR spectra and we, and um, of the solid, by the way, we didn't see anything from the liquid. So if we take the solid of this polymer, we can run the EPR and we can get signal at a variety of different temperatures. Not only that, to our surprise, if we do the four point probe measurement, we can get some charge moving. So we can get um, conductivity in the 10 to the minus three Siemens per centimeter, which I had my student run this about 10 times because I'm like, I, I don't believe it. So we ran it several times, it's reproducible. And so we are at a loss as to what's going on here because it's not really behaving at the polyaniline, but at whatever is happening, you are having some um, electron in the backbone of the polymer. We can see that free electrons and we can see them moving by the conductivity measurement. So we're still have asking questions about this at the moment. So as I was saying, in the acidic form, you would expect protonation of this to this imine form that can rearrange to give you the um, the cation, the the radical cation that you should be able to see through EPR. We were not able to see it under the acidic version, but we were able to see it in the basic form. Uh, it's not quite basic; it's still acidic, but according to the zeta potential is slightly negative at this point. So we have question here. When you take, um, look at the, um, the, the TEM image of these, of these um, films, you can see that under the basic form, they're, they're kind of linked in a chain. 
And so we think that this chain linkage has something to do with the conductivity of the polymer. If you um, zoom in a little bit more, you can see that these things are, are pretty linked um, together. However, under the acidic regime, it's pretty horrible films. Um, there's a little bit of linking in the background, but it's, it's, it's not really clear from the TEM image. And we have these salts that we can't seem to get rid of when we try to um, acidify the polymer. And so for that, we were encouraged, but still kind of puzzled as to what's going on with this polymer. So we decide why not go to the, the polymer that we should be able to follow more clearly that rese more resembles the polyaniline. And so for that polymer, we decided we do a, a similar synthetic route. So we take phenoxazine, brominate that, do the buchwart hardwick reaction to make the polymer. And again, the, the proton NMR is pretty clear. We can find all our peaks. We're pretty happy with that. And we made different R groups on um, the phenoxazine nitrogen. And if you, as you increase the size of the, of the R group, as you would expect, the solubility increase. So if the R group is just a methyl group, um, you get 30% of the polymer soluble. But as you go to larger and larger R group, you can get up to 95% of the polymer soluble. So we're pretty happy with that. If you look at the FTIR spectra, so the top case is the acidic, sorry, the undoped state, so the basic form, and the bottom is the dope state. Again, we're looking for the ratio of these quinoid to benzoid. So you can see the quinoid um, peaks right about here and the benzoid peak. And similar to polyaniline, when you dope it, you get an equal ratio here of the, of the, well, I'm using equal ratio, but we haven't integrated it. But you can see both the, the substantial quinoid and benzoid form of the polymer. Um, this is a preliminary XRD spectra. We'll run high resolution um, wax later on, but usually we just run an XRD just to see if we can see any peaks or how, um, if we can see semi-crystalline behavior of the, the polymer and it does have some, this is the acidic form, it does have some semi-crystalline behavior. So we'll send these off to run wax um, later on. We were not able to see anything in the DSC. So that's why we were doing this XRD. So back to the original question at hand, does it behave like polyaniline? Again, just to remind you, polyaniline absorbs around 600 under the, the undoped basic state. Once you dope it, it absorbs around 800. And to our, um, well, relief, I guess, it does behave in this case at polyaniline because it does have the polyaniline backbone. So under the basic form, it absorbs around 650. Under the acidic form, it absorbs around 950. And even the color changes are similar to polyaniline. So this was one good result that helped us prove that we were on the right track, at least with this polymer. And um, we, we took the film and we looked under AFM with a magnetic tip and we could see some magnetic um, properties of the polymer and, um, and we could see some paramagnetic um, um, properties as well when we ran these um, um, with magnetic susceptibility experiments. So we, we actually did, uh, went back and do the EPR. So we did that originally as a quick test so we came back and we did the EPR spectra. And again, we get pretty good EPR spectra at different temperatures. And, um, and we can also do, see the different um, dopants. So depending on the CSA, camphor sulfonic acid, polystyrene sulfonate, and so forth, we can get different. We can see that we still have um, our polarons formation. I put this data here. I am not an expert in EPR, but I know these are important. And um, any help I could get later on on, on um, looking at um, looking at the these EPR because 
um, there's data missing here, but the ratio of A over B, so the peak on the negative to the peak on the positive are not, is not one. And in some cases, much different from one. Um, the peak to peak um, line width um, varies as well, and it varies with the dopant. And the G factor, again, is a little bit higher than, um, than I would expect. So um, this, the G factor from my understanding suggests that the, 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 the radical, um, the spin is more delocalized over the, 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 the nitrogen, oxygen, and the aromatic system. So the other question is, does it, is it electrochemically stable? And so um, we, can, we can take um, polyaniline, and for polyaniline, after several cycles, actually this is about four or five cycles, you start to build up some new species B here. And this new species B is due to decomposition of the polymer during the redox cycle. Now, we put our polymer through the same um, window, and you can see that after 10 cycles, there's no new B building up. So there, no, there's no decomposition happening. And there, this is just the different colors at the different stage. And even after 100 cycles, so this is our 100 cycle case, again, you still don't see any B building up. So what this is saying that not only is it reversible, but it's redox stable, um, at least in this window that we're working in. And I can show you again, we can run this for several cycles. Um, this is some specky, uh, well, this is just some CV data. If you connect it, you can see the color change actually go in between the blue and the green as the, the potential changes. So we have good evidence that it's behaving as polyaniline, but not only that, that we can process it and it's redox stable. So the other question is now, is it conductive? So here we do the conductivity study. Again, we do a four point pro measurement. We take the, um, the IV curve and we take the slope of that, which, and do some calculations from that using resistivity and find from resistivity and the um, so the, the geometric conversion factor and the, the thickness of the film, we can get the conductivity. And so this is pretty interesting data. So when we did this before, we made sure our samples are dry and everything. We tried different dopants and, and different spin coding condition, different film forming condition. And I'm just showing you the summary of what we, 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 we think is, is, is important. And so we found from the literature that Cresol had somehow made the conductivity increase. So we tried doping, this time we doped with PSS, um, polythal, um, styrene sulfonate and TFA, and we did some spin coating and some slow drying and different things. And then when we put it in Cresol, but then we let it dry, that's the slow drying, then we get conductivity about 10 to the minus two Siemens per centimeter. But if we take it out the cresol and we don't let it dry fully, the conductivity jumps up pretty good, twofold. So we're like, well, that's not fair, it's not dry. So we try that again. So if we just do um, CSA dry, um, we get very poor conduct, well, not too good conductivity. Likewise, if we change the solvent to say NMP and we make that dry, we don't get such good conductivity. But if we make it damp, we get better conductivity. And so we decided to do a test. So if we take the sample and we spin coat it and we allow it to um, go and crease our vapor. So we just put it in a chamber of crease off for some time. If we run the conductivity, um, we get good conductivity, but as we heat it up and we dry it, you see the conductivity starts to fall. So we found a paper that kind of sort of explain it. Um, and what we saw was that in, without Cresol, the films were pretty bad. And so the connectivity of the films weren't, weren't the, film, the, the polymers weren't as connected as they should. But 
in Cresol, you get these fiber-like um, um, films. And so we believe that's what's helping with the conductivity. As you remove Cresol, it goes back to this very powdery-like film. And so we think that's why um, the conductivity increased with Cresol. And so we decided to make a series of these. So last um, summer, I was at a conference with Dr. Swagger, and he suggested to remove this di um, methyl group on the paraphenylene diamine, which we did. And we also incorporate a different um, group in carbazole, but we still maintain the polyaniline backbone. So we did it with the dimethyl and without the dimethyl group. So the synthesis is the same. We brominate the phenoxazine or the carbazole, and then we do a buqua hartwig reaction to make the polymer. And we can do that pretty good. Proton NMR is similar. We can account for our peaks. They're, they're more broader this time, um, depending on the molecular weight we get. So one of the problems without the dimethyl um, groups on the paraphenylene is solubility we immediately ran into solubility problem. So the dimethyl group here helps with the solubility. Um, and of course, these are gonna be a little bit more crystalline, which is good, but again, solubility becomes a problem. And so you can see that in the protein NMR, we couldn't get it in the solvent as, as good as if we have the dimethyl groups on the paraphenylene diamine. Again, the FTIR spectra, this is just shown for P3. We can account for the, polar, the um, benzoid and the quinoid peaks that we're looking for. Looks similar to, para, um, to PANI. And, um, and now we did the same thing. That's it be, do they behave like polyaniline, which we expect them to do, and they do. So here I'm showing in the solid line, so the solid line is the undoped version of all four polymers, including the one I talked about before. And the, the dashed lines, these are the dope. So you can see for all the dashed lines, it's, you can see the polaron formation here. So they all were fine. The, the CV looked fine um, for all. You can see the two redox peak um, in the CV for all the polymers. And for the, for the carbazole polymer, instead of going from blue to green, it's actually starting pink. So it's a little bit more blue shifted than the phenoxazine polymer. And so the, um, even though you still get in the green, it's not as far green as the phenoxazine polymer. So that's the only difference there. And um, to, to wrap this up, um, we can, all the polymers we can, the EPR spectra um, are what we expect. We can see um, polaron formation. This is what I was talking about. The A to B ratio are not the same. Also for the polymers, the, the peak to peak um, width um, varies quite a bit. So we don't quite understand why that is. Conductivity wise, they're pretty similar. Um, if we do the NMP um, solvent with polystyrene sulfonate, we get a pretty similar conductivity within experimental error. So these are not highly conductive. I think we just have to um, treat them under different conditions. We can improve the conductivity, but they're conductive. So to conclude on this section, um, we, we um, I've introduced this new panty-like polymers. We've determined that they're redox stable, they're processable, conductive, and they have paramagnetic properties. And you can imagine um, changing the heteroatom for a series, which is what we're planning to do going forward. All right, so I'm gonna pick up the pace just a little bit more um, because of time constraint. And I wanna talk a little bit about post-functionalization of high performance materials using CH activation reaction. So why do we want to post-functionalize polymers? Well, we can enhance or enlarge their properties so we can um, incorporate new properties into polymers. We can thus broaden their application and in turn extend their use and their value. And this will take advantage of their original properties. 
So the traditional approach for making these kind of um, polymers is to first functionalize the monomers and then build up the polymer. But to do that, you have to come up with new reactions all the time and figure out new polymerization conditions to get new polymers. So that's the disadvantage of using um, the traditional way. Most of the times you get low molecular polymer because you have to come up with new polymerization condition it, as, the, as the monomer changes. So post-functionalization um, takes advantage of the fact that we know how to make polymers and we know how to make them well. So why not just take them and post-functionalize them, thus leveraging the fact that we can make a lot of them at low cost. Um, the, the, the industry and infrastructure is already there. And so we can increase their value by just doing upcycling the waste products and making new, new materials. Of course, there are challenges to this, right? Because polymers like these are stable in part because their bonds are stable. And so they're not easy to, to react. Um, and also your reaction should be sufficiently high in a post-functionalization so that you can get enough of the functionality to make a change. And of course, you have a ton of the same bonds, and so chemoselectivity is important. And our current methods to post-functionalize polymers can sometimes be very harsh and give you degradation of the polymers. So that's not good. So the idea um, of using CH functionalization was discussed in this Agavante paper by Frank Leifart Leafart and um, a really good job, um, this paper, and it gets you to think of the fact that if you want to accomplish this, you have to see CH bonds not as inert, inert bonds, but as functional bonds. And so um, that's where CH functionalization comes in. So you have to be able to selectively cleave a bond in this polymer backbone. So that would have been daunting to think about several years or decades, but even years ago. But now the CH functionalization chemistry has become very robust and milder so that you can actually selectively um, functionalize one CH bond over another that are similar in similar environment. Um, of course, we already have the starting material, which is the polymer. And also if we can minimize degradation, CH functionalization also eliminate toxic waste. So um, just to quickly um, compare CH functionalization with traditional cross-coupling method or even traditional functional group method is for traditional method, you functionalize your material several different ways to get to your final functional group. In the cross-coupling, you have to functionalize your monomer, functionalize your study material with some halogen or some of your cross-coupling metals to do the cross-coupling reaction. But in CH activation, you're just taking a CH bond without any of these functionalization and directly converting it to your product of choice. So of course, the disadvantages to the traditional method is the toxic waste that you produce, several reaction steps, some of the, reaction, the waste are stoichiometric, but we know how to do those chemistry, right? And for direct air relation or CH activation chemistry, CH bonds are typically thermodynamically unfavorable. So you have to find a way to activate them and selectively activate them. But in turns, you can reduce the number of steps and eliminate your waste. So we've decided to explore high performance materials. In this, in this we're thinking aromatic polymers. Most people are doing upcycling are looking at sp3 um, hybridized polymers um, more commodity type of, um, polymers and so um, we've decided to do aromatic polymers and some of the the, the properties are the pros for these of these high performance polymers that they're chemically thermally stable um, they have application in extreme condition and most importantly they have these high modulus and tensile strength however they're difficult to process normally, and, um, and they tend to be expensive. So if you have something that 
you have to go through a lot of trouble to make in the first place, why you just want to toss it in the trash when you're finished with it? Why not find new ways of using these um, high performance material to expand and extend their lifetime? And so that's what we're thinking of doing in this chemistry. So some examples of these high performance materials are like polyimids, and these are um, typically used as insulators and passivation layers for, in, in, for electronics. Um, they tend to be thermally stable, have good chemical resistance, and are overall um, um, good mechanical properties. But again, some of the problem is processability. And so here are just some examples where um, polyimids are used as sun shield um, in the, in, for telescope and um, for satellites. And mostly, as, as you said up here, um, for electronic application due to mechanical strength. So it says a lot of applications of polyimid um, commercial, commercially. It's not stable under basic or strong acid condition um, as a, a con. The polyethers, I'm sorry, polysulfone ethers, again, similar to the polyimids, they're high temp, they're temp thermally stable. They, they have flame resistant properties. They're strong, stiff, and um, they are resistant to some, to some chemicals. But they're not resistant to organic sol um, solvents and they're not stable to weathering. So after a while, they will weather away. Um, so some examples of use are like um, these pans that are made of polysulfonol to heat your food and in automotive components. Um, to replace metals. And polystyrene wouldn't necessarily be considered high performance in, term of, in terms of thermal stability, but in terms of having aromatic groups, we, I, we include them in this list. And so we all know polystyrene are used a lot in um, um, mostly as um, protective or packing in the packing industry. Many, several, several tons are produced every year. Um, they're relatively inert chemicals. They're not degradable, which can be a problem. And of course, recycling in this country is horrible. Um, it's only probably 27% of any plastic that's ever recycled, over 300 million tons that are produced. And the one that we're interested in um, is the polyphenol ether. Um, it has some really great properties as well, thermally and radiation stable, chemically stable, high refractive index, good optical clarity, and high surface area. One of the applications of um, this polyphenol ether is that they're used as engine oil in these, um, in spacecraft and also in these jets. And so, um, but the reason we were interested in it for the fact that it's a liquid at room temperature and we can work with it more easily. And it's a smaller polymeric material. So we got inspiration from the polystyrene, chemi um, some work that was done on polystyrene by the Bay Group. And so they were able to CH functionalize um, polystyrene with bor um, this boron species um, to do CH borrelation. And they were able to, to see that they were maintaining their tacticity didn't get messed up. You can even do it on the polysulfonone ethers, and it works. They use these in, um, in membranes for, um, for, for exchanging in iron, iron membrane exchange. So we took that and we took our pump oil and we did the same CH borrelation reaction. And you can see that um, here's the pump oil. We know the reaction worked because we can see the pinnacle boring um, group. And we can see changes in the aromatic region. And, um, and we were able to also just do a quick Suzuki reaction on this boring species so you can see the pinnacle boring go away. And um, you can hardly see the thiophene under here, but they're somewhere under here as you would expect them to be. Not only that, this is just the blow up of the aromatic region to show the newer peaks. But not only that, the absorption spectra changes as you um, do some chemistry. So here is just the polyphenol ether. Once you do the borrelation, you can see a slight blue shift, I'm sorry, red shift in the 
in the absorption spectra, it's even more, more um, pronounced once you do the Suzuki reaction. Not only in the absorption spectra, but also in the emission spectra. So here, um, the absorption for the Suzuki, but now you can get emission in the visible region, uh, right around the 400, but right on the, the bridge of the visible region um, of the spectra. So now you're changing the property of this pump oil just by doing a few um, post-functional relation. What you're not changing is the molecular, um, you're not destroying the polymer. So we can see that from GC analysis. So the green represents the polyphenol ether. Uh, we did do some silicon chemistry. I didn't include it in there, but it's in the GPC data. But the blue, that's your boron, is supposed to be bigger because you're um, putting that pinnacle borane. And then once you convert that to the thiophene, it's a, it's a little bit smaller. But you can see this little um, shoulder here for the thiophene with a, with a decent molecular weight. So what you're not doing is destroying the polymer. Here's just a more blow up region. And here is just the low molecular weight region, which is not changing much. So that's from the instrument. And if you look at the, um, the thermal degradation of this, you can see again that here in the green, that's your, your, your um, polyphenol ether oil. But all the reaction, you're maintaining the thermal stability of the polymer to, to um, thermal degradation, even increasing it as you put the thiophene on. So this was pretty, um, results was, was encouraging. And here's just a table just to, to, to summarize what I just showed you in the, in the graphs, in the spectra. So also the polydispersity, as you can see from the GPC is not changing much. So we're pretty pleased with the fact that we're not destroying this polymer and we're maintaining the, um, the thermal properties. So we decided to do something useful with it. We weren't quite sure what to make. So we've been making adhesive in the lab. So we're like, let's just make an adhesive. It'll be really quick and it will see if we can maintain the property of the polyphenol ether in the adhesive. And so um, we were set out to make this clear, high temperature um, epoxy resin and make an adhesive with it. So from the borelation reaction, we can do oxidation just to get to the, 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 the phenyl compound. And from there, we do a substitution with this epoxy group to put the epoxy on there to make the epoxy resin. And then we can cross-link that with some triamine um, to get the cross-link um, adhesive. So proton NMR stage, so here is the boron again. Um, I showed you this spectra. And so once you do the oxidation, you can see the phenolic proton out here. So we can see that we remove the pinnacle boron group and we can see the, the phenol group out here. And once you do the alkylation, those groups go away and you can now see these uh, methylene group and methane group from the epoxy resin um, from this portion of the spectra in this region. And once again, looking at the thermal stability, so the pink peak, that's your pump, that's your um, original um, um, polyphenol ether. And again, while well, there's a little bit of degradation, especially for the crosslink compound, originally the, 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 the full degradation of the polymers after you functionalize them are not totally being destroyed. And so um, that's, that's good news for, for these polymers. So we're encouraged. So the, the, the other news is this is the epoxy, not the epoxy resin, this is the crosslink compound I was telling you that there's some degradation up, up to 300 degrees, but it's not much, it's about 10%. And then you start seeing the, it degrades later. Interestingly, is the, um, the, the glass transition temperature. So I'll show you in the table that the cross-link compound has a higher glass, glass transition temperature. So of course, the, the study material was a liquid, so there's no glass transition temperature there. But as you make it into a solid, you can increase the glass transition temperature of your material depending on what you 
want to make. And so finally, here is our proof. We can make adhesive. It glued this glass together. Here's a little blow up of that. And um, we didn't have time to do share, share te um, testing and all that, but we'll do the different mechanical um, testing um, coming up in the next couple of weeks. So finally, here's my final slide. So here again, I was telling you the, the glass transition temperature increased as you do certain chemistry to the pump oil. And um, I was pretty pleased with the 78 for the glass transition temperature of the adhesive. And we haven't even manipulated the triamine to improve on that. So this, this was a good first step. So to summarize this, post-functionalization of commodity products can be a viable way to access new materials. Um, the advances in CH functionalization will allow us to do robust chemistry um, post-functionalized polymer. And so for us in our lab, um, we are just thinking of new materials that we can get from these um, already um, versatile, strong, um, high-performance materials. So with that, I would like to thank the students and my postdoc. So my postdoc, Dai Jun Fung, um, did the CH functionalization of cycling work uh, with, um, along with um, a, a past student with uh, a master's degree, Eric, and the, um, the, the um, conducting polymer work is done by Mohammed and Ranga, um, two graduate students in my group. I want to thank the funding agency, um, the Center for Selective Functionalization for giving us money to do CH functionalization, and also the Center for Emerging of Molecular Opto Electronics. I didn't talk about this project, but it gives us money to make emissive dyes and our recently funded career um, grant to help to make these pa um, panning-like uh, materials. And with that, I'd like to thank you again for your patience and thanks for the invitation. And um, I welcome any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, Colleen, uh, what we can do is we can open it to questions. If people want to ask questions, please raise your hand and I'll call on you. And I can unmute you. I'm not sure if you can unmute yourselves, but um, looking, well, maybe I'll just start it off here. And um, uh, Colleen, you can hear me, correct? I, I can. Yes. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, your first polymer, your polyrhodamine, cool uh -huh. material, you kind of, it looks like you got it got shelved, but I wonder if you did, I mean, the, I think the problem, right, is that when you acidify it, that also uh, ends up closing up the ring into the spiral form, right? Actually, it should be the opposite. Once you acidify it, you should open the ring because this should get protonated here. Yeah, but, uh, but it might be the nitrogens get protonated. I mean, if you acidify it enough, I guess. Yeah, if you acidify it enough, yes. Yeah, I guess I was thinking that, you know, you acidify it. Well, for example, if you take fluorescein mm -hmm. and you put it in acidic media, it tends to close up and then it opens in basic media, right? That's what I was kind of going on with oh, this fluorescein. And I, I, well, I guess I wonder if, you know, if you protonate it, it you know, the, the spiroform tends to kind of put more electron density out on the nitrogens. You could form, uh, you know, maybe you can protonate it enough, you can get everything there. But have you thought about just trying to functionalize the carboxylic acid in some way, like forming like in dialkyl amide or something just to kind of change that part of it? We, so yes, we, we, we've thought about it. Um, we tried just, we tried to do a esterification after the polymerization that didn't quite work too well. Um, yeah, we could do like an amide or something or even an amine that could still or, give us the closed form to do the polymerization and then open it back later. Or, or something, or maybe even something like a benzoxazole. Like, so if you have like a, you know, orthoaminophenol and you condense it and you form a five-membered heterocycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wonder if something like that might not 
change the properties quite dramatically of this the, material. It's, the, pro the problem is it's difficult to do it post-functionalization. So we, we wanted to do it pre-functionalization, pre-polymerization, I should say. And that kind of gets a little bit sticky in trying to get the ditriflated compound without this this position being functional. No, it doesn't have to cyclize. We could do something out here, but that will put a triflate or OH group at this center so that you can get the triflation here to do the, 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 the amidation chemistry. So that's, that's not impossible um, to do, but it's difficult to do it post-functionalization. Okay. It's, I will have to look at the reaction conditions before again, but no, when we were trying to do it before, we didn't quite understand this polymer. So right. it's something we could go back to now that we, I can look at the NMR in a second and tell if it worked or not worked before it took a while to figure out all these aromatic peaks. But yeah. now I can, I can look at it in a second. So we could probably go back to that and try that. I, I think it's worth doing. Yeah, anyway, it's just that falls into this category. Ideas are cheap. It's very hard to make them work. But <laughs> <laughs> so other 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 people have questions. You raise your hands and I'll uh, you can be unmuted. I'm not sure I'm seeing any raised hands. Um, maybe one one other thing. So you you're using this the uh, the orthocresol uh -huh. you know, treatment. And that's that's something that uh, you know I was able to be Alan McDermott's colleague when he was doing all these things, and one of the things that he fa they found is that you know there are two things it's doing. One is it's kind of um, you know solubilizing the charges and making them uh, you know lowering electrostatic pinning of the carriers, but it also tended to plasticize the material and yes. and promote crystallinity. Did you ever? Did you ever just try and treat it and then, um, you know, look at the crystallinity after you treat it or before and after or see if you're changing the structure, the, the solid state structure of the material? That's what this is about. So this is without any cresol. And, mm -hmm. and you can see from the SCM image, it's totally different looking than if you put the cresol on. But did, did you see a crystal? Is it, so this is a more- Yeah, so in, in before the cresol, these tend to be very brittle. And, and, and we have pictures of that. They crack easily. But when you treat it with cresol, the film just becomes nice. It's, it's, it's like you said, plasticized but and- um, and it's there's no crack anywhere. It's not brittle anymore. But I, I wonder if you if you did an X-ray before and after, if you saw a change in the kind of. So we're we're tr so th that's a good question. So that's something we were going to do. We wanted to. We did a quick X-ray on the instrument we have here. Um, so. We'll, we'll have to send it off to um, Southern Miss to do uh, more extensive um, x-ray. But yeah, that's something I suggest um, to my student to look at. So let's look at the percent crystallinity before and after it's treated with cresol. Yeah. Okay. So I think we gave our, our guy a sample with the cresol. He just hasn't gotten back to us with it. But I don't expect to see much from this instrument here because it doesn't it can't do as good as, of a job as the one that they have at Southern Miss. So, but this just gives us preliminary information to see if we need to pay money to go to send it off somewhere else. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I don't want to dominate everything. I'm not sure. I'm not seeing. And any. I can't. I can't see any. I don't have access. I can't see any. I'm looking at the participants. I don't see any hands. Anybody have any hands? Or uh, there's nothing in chat either. Okay. Well, um, I think you know uh, we're probably going to lose a few people here, getting close to five. But um, mm -hmm. thank you all for hanging with us, and Colleen for uh, delivering an awesome lecture under extraordinary circumstances. You showed your um, your poise 
uh, like you are uh, getting ready for to jump 21 A competition <laughs> Yeah, competition like I, I showed him I showed him your record uh, 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 long jump and triple jump uh, uh, exploits and the, the picture of you uh, uh, jumping and and you certainly we made you jump through some hoops today to give this lecture <laughs> and and uh, hopefully we'll get it down next time because you're the first person in this series so thank you for bearing with us and I wish I, we could have come to MIT in person so I could take you out for a nice dinner tonight, but I owe you one of those in the future and uh, we'll, we'll connect and have it. So um, so anyway, uh, thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Colleen, for an awesome lecture. And, uh, and thanks great. again for the invitation. And, um, and if anyone has questions later on, you can get my email. I always tell people it's easy to find me. I'm the prettiest one on the website. So, <laughs> so you can <laughs> you can email me question later on if you if you have some. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank have you. Have a good evening. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>